Hell's Gate, Shandorovka, 1943. As every day passed, the Soviet double encirclement tightened and began to choke the German garrisons that were trapped inside. It was a matter of time before the Germans were either shot or taken prisoner by the thousands. But the Fuhrer insisted on holding the ground to the last man. Field Marshal Erik von Manstein was not willing to lose his men in a fight they could not win. Knowing that disgrace would fall upon him, he ignored Hitler's direct order and commanded a retreat to save as many soldiers as possible. But when the Soviets realized what he was doing, they raced to capture the only hill that opened the way for a breakthrough. With less than 400 tanks left, the seasoned von Manstein knew that the fate of more than 60,000 Germans now depended solely on the efforts of his waning and outnumbered 3rd Panzer Corps. A weakened Wehrmacht. Following the gruesome outcome of the Battle of Stalingrad in February of 1943, the Wehrmacht knew that it was only a matter of time before they turned to the defensive. The German High Command had underestimated the will of the Soviets, the sheer number of men at their disposal, and more importantly, their production capabilities. But there was no turning back now, and the Wehrmacht had to do with the few resources men and armored vehicles it had at its disposal. After experiencing three consecutive winters on the Eastern Front and going through the biggest tank battle in history, the Battle of Kursk, Field Marshal Erik von Manstein's Army Group South was exhausted, to say the least. Following the encounter at Kursk in July of 1943, the Soviet Union quickly launched a colossal counteroffensive that pushed the Germans to the banks of the Dnieper River in Ukraine. Here, the Wehrmacht had established the panther Wotan Line as a defensive position against another Soviet offensive. Still, by the time von Manstein and his men arrived, construction had barely started. The Red Army commanders were aware and pushed forward with overwhelming force. Setback after setback. On October 1st, 1943, the 3rd Ukrainian Front, led by Rodion Manilovsky, had contact with the Germans near Zaporizhia. Almost simultaneously, the 4th Ukrainian Front struck von Manstein's southern flank, protected by the 6th Army, led by Colonel General Karl Holit. The 45 Soviet infantry divisions quickly overwhelmed Holit's 13 understrength divisions with the support of 400 artillery batteries, and then went for von Manstein. Casualties quickly mounted up for both sides, and the outnumbered Germans were only saved by the rainy season, bringing the Soviet advance to an abrupt stop in November. Still, Commander Nikolai Valutin resumed the attacks in early December, and Soviet tanks and German armor clashed in furious skirmishes. Many German tankers were surrounded during these fights and attempted to link up with their units before surrendering. One of them was young Sergeant Franz Hofbauer from the 3rd Fusilier Battalion, 72. Surrounded near the town of Sherkazy, his men fought desperately, while low on ammunition and supplies. But thanks to a spirited defense and a surprise attack against the Soviets, Sergeant Hofbauer and his troops were able to break through the hostile encirclement and survive to fight another day. Hofbauer would later be awarded the Knight's Cross for his extraordinary leadership, and like him, hundreds of men fought to their last breath before von Manstein's 4th Panzer Army was decimated. Von Manstein tried to convince Hitler that it would be wise to withdraw from the sector to link up reinforcements and attack the Soviets later, but the Fuhrer was not willing to lose an inch of ground without putting up a fight, even calling the field marshal a defeatist. By January of 1944, the German units had successfully broken out of multiple Soviet involvement moves, but Hitler still refused to approve a tactical withdrawal. As the situation became unbearable and the Red Army violently crossed the Dnieper, only two German corps opposed their dominance in the area. They were the 11th and 42nd Panzer Corps, under the command of General Wilhelm Stemmermann and Lieutenant General Theobald Lieb, which were in control of a salient west of Sherkazy that extended some 100 kilometers to Kenev and Korsun. Committed to destroying these units once and for all, Joseph Stalin and the Stavka, the Soviet High Command, began planning an ambitious offensive aimed at liberating all of Ukraine and conquering the Crimean Peninsula. Soviet Deep Penetration Tactics 
The Soviet plan was to launch four different large-scale attacks across the region to spread the German forces thin and significantly weaken them. The enemy lines would be breached by spearheading armored divisions and mechanized infantry that would not stop until they were fully encircled by a double envelopment and Crimea was isolated. Once the flanks of the German lines were blocked by the armored units, the Soviet infantry would make its way through the gaps and finish off the scattered enemy forces. Meanwhile, the spearheading troops would exploit the strategic depth by destroying the logistical capabilities of the Germans, making it more difficult for them to patch up their broken front line. The operation was envisioned by Generals Nikolai Valutin and Ivan Konev. The generals sought to eliminate the forces stationed at the Dnieper Bulge by employing a double encirclement plan similar to the one used to liberate Stalingrad a year earlier. The inner circle forces would comprise infantry units and some tanks to fend off any German counterattacks. At the same time, the outer envelopment would be made up entirely of armored and mechanized units to form an impenetrable barrier. The Lutin and Konev's plan followed Soviet deep operation tactics, a warfare method that emphasized the destruction and disorganization of enemy forces across the depth of the area of operations, and not just the point of contact. This strategy called for the Soviet forces to spearhead an operation to break the enemy front line with their numerical advantage and brute force. The Soviets had more than 320,000 men, 500 tanks, and over 5,200 artillery pieces, in addition to over 1,000 aircraft to support the initial assaults. Meanwhile, the Germans at the Dnieper pocket had over 60,000 men, 60 tanks, and 242 artillery pieces. No retreat, no surrender. Although Stemmermann and Lieb would receive about 70,000 reinforcements in the upcoming weeks, they were still heavily outnumbered and highly constrained when it came to supplies and armament. Lieb's 42nd Army Corps consisted of remnants of the hardened Waffen SS 5th Panzer Division Viking, the SS Valoninin Brigade made up of Belgian volunteers. Captain Leon de Grel, along with the highest decorated non German soldiers of the SS, and survivors from the 112th, 255th, and 332nd Infantry Divisions were part of the brigade. Stemmermann's 11th Army Corps also comprised remnants of other infantry divisions, the 14th Panzer Division and the 213th Security Division. On January 24th, the 2nd Ukrainian Front attacked the Bulge from the southeast, achieving a successful breakthrough, exploited by the 5th Guards Tank Army and the 5th Guards Cavalry Corps. Meanwhile, after only three days, other Soviet brigades had occupied Lysyanka and encircled Zvenigorodka. Although the Germans had to retreat to prevent the dispersal of their forces, their artillery was pinpoint accurate and provided strong resistance against any Soviet tank formation that dared to approach them while on the move. Still, the Soviets made territorial gains, but at a high cost. The Waffen SS troops of the Viking Division conducted swift attacks from the flanks of the Second Ukrainian Front inflicting heavy losses to the enemy armor that had gone too far to keep the breakthrough's momentum. The Red Army was committed to bypassing the attacking German Tigers and Panthers to close the ring around the Wehrmacht troops at Cherkasy, and it was not uncommon to see Soviet T-34 units pass in front of firing German tanks without even attempting to invade them or counterattack. Then, on January 28th, the Soviet tanks successfully linked up with other mechanized units and completely sealed off the Dnieper Bend, while Generals Valutin and Konev sent more troops to reinforce the outer ring from German incursions. As General Herbert Otto Gila, commander of the 5th SS Panzer Division Viking, saw the dire situation coming, he contacted Heinrich Himmler and wrote, quote, In three hours, the encirclement of my division will be accomplished. No response was ever sent. Von Manstein was aware of this, and immediately assembled the 47th Panzer Corps for a relief effort. General Hermann Breit, the commander of the 3rd Panzer Corps, also suggested forming a corridor to allow the surrounded troops to get out. Still, the Führer intervened and told him that the attack should turn into a counter-encircle to decimate the Soviets. After some futile attempts to encircle the Soviets' outer pocket, the soldiers from the 3rd Panzer Corps organized themselves to break through and relieve Stremmermann and Lieb. Then, on February 11th, the 16th and 17th Panzer Divisions made way for the Ganiloi Tikich River while protected by the 1st Panzer Division and the SS Liebstandarte. The encounters with the Soviet tank corps were brutal, and fuel, 
Smoke and burning steel filled the ambiance as the pocket tightened around the encircled German troops and their aggressors. Hell's Gate. While the Panzer groups attempted to relieve Stemmermann and Lieb, they had their own desperate battles against the Soviet infantry and armor. Meanwhile, to end the onslaught and the stiff German resistance, Valutin and Konev sent emissaries to discuss surrender demands, but the Germans refused and decided to keep fighting. By February 12th, resources began to run short for the 60,000 defenders, despite the continuous air supplies dropped by the Luftwaffe. The remnant of the German infantry divisions did their best to secure towns and gather food for the wounded, with the Viking division providing the security of the entire garrison within the pocket. After the third Panzer Corps thrust stalled, Stemmermann and Lieb were told that it was up to them to break through the encirclement by their own means. It was agreed that they would have to make their way through Hill 239 and the town of Shandorovka to make it back to friendly territory. Still, the Soviets soon noticed the movement of the German forces and quickly conquered the hill, which cost the generals countless casualties. Shandorovka was thus baptized Hell's Gate because of the fierce clashes between tanks and the terrible artillery strikes of the Soviet batteries. In addition, the Soviet Air Force night bombings carrying incendiaries led to numerous Ukrainian casualties and the loss of wounded German soldiers. The Breakthrough On February 16th, von Manstein radioed Stemmermann and told him that they only had one chance to break through at 11 p.m. through Lysyanka. If they failed, they were doomed. With extreme remorse, Stemmermann and Lieb decided that they would have to leave 1,500 wounded behind for the more than 40,000 others to survive. Then, at dusk, three columns of panzers and infantry began to move through the landscape to reach Lysyanka, but the 20th Soviet Tank Corps, with new IS tanks, attempted to halt their advance. Some of the T-34s pierced through the German columns and began to attack the rearguard, with hundreds of support troops, wounded men, and medical personnel losing their lives under the tracks of the savage T-34s. Still, the German columns kept their pace and reached the Ganiloy ticket stream by midday. But just as they were about to catch a break, they realized the creek was 15 meters wide and 2 meters deep. A race against time then began as they started building improvised bridgeheads before more Soviet troops advanced through the stream. Meanwhile, the 3rd Panzer Corps provided cover destroying any Soviet armor that dared breach the perimeter. Time was running out, and the Germans could not hold against the overwhelming enemy for long. Consumed by panic, many soldiers drowned, and many others were swept downstream, never to be seen again. Thousands of troops crossed the bridges as the day advanced, successfully breaking through the Soviet advancement. However, the cost was too high. The Germans lost more than 80% of their supplies and equipment, which would leave thousands of men without a rifle, clothing, or food. And although several sources contradict themselves, it is generally accepted that from the 60,000 Germans trapped within the pocket, 40,000 made it out, with over 30,000 wounded or shot down from the relief groups. As for the Soviet forces, the attack groups suffered over 80,000 casualties and lost more than 700 tanks. The clashes at korsun sharkazi marked the beginning of Soviet deep penetration operations on the Eastern Front, and even though the Soviets didn't totally eradicate the German presence in the area, the battle would put constant stress on the weakened German forces and would mark a significant deterioration in their troops. Thank you for watching our video. Please like and subscribe to our Dark Documentaries channels to find more exciting historical content. And let us know in the comments below what you think of the deep penetration tactics employed by the Soviets. Stay tuned for more.